So good evening, everyone, and welcome to Adventures in Horticulture. This is your bonus episode, so to speak, and it's been brought to you courtesy of Vicky Cook from Plant Heritage. And Vicky, I used to work with at Wright and Organic Gardens many moons ago. And um, basically, she's she's been on a very illustrious career since I, I left. Um, she's become head gardener at Hampton Court Vegetable Garden for a while and now works with Plant Heritage. And I will let her explain everything else by herself. So welcome, Vicky. Hello everyone and thank you Lou for your kind introduction. Uh, yeah I suppose I have been working with heritage plants for quite a while now because I was at the Heritage Seed Library when I was working with Lou up at Wright in Organic Gardens. Um, that is a national collection it's also uh, so the UK uh, heritage vegetables um, and then at uh, Hampton Court well it was quite nice to be growing heritage vegetables in a heritage setting rather than a sort of a slightly musty polytunnel in Warwickshire so uh, so I've always had a sort of a keen interest in our horticultural history and heritage. And so, um, yeah, when the job came up at um, Plant Heritage, it thought it seemed like the ideal opportunity to combine all of my true loves. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you tonight about uh, the National Plant Collections and a bit of the work of Plant Heritage, share some stories of the collections. I know that it won't be um, the idea of the collections won't be alien to all of you, uh, hopefully. Um, but what I'd really like to think is that by the end of this, you start thinking holding a national collection is like the greatest adventure in horticulture that you could possibly have. So uh, I'm going to share my screen. And started. OK, let's see if I can do this bit. I should do. I've hosted enough of these. OK, right, let me try and move it over there. Have you still got it? Ah, screen sharing has paused. No, have you still got it? Yeah, okay, perfect. Ooh, oh, no, it's doing something funny. Right, okay. That's perfect. Brilliant, brilliant. So, well, we'll start off very simply with what is a national plant collection. Uh, it is a well-defined set of plants that represents part of our national heritage. Um, it is very simply people who have undertaken to conserve a sort of a set and well-defined group of plants um, to keep it in trust for future generations. And they come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, there are 30, a collection of miniature orchids that's held in a terrarium in someone's living room. Um, we have 400 magnolias on the Savile Garden estate. Um, there's eight dianthus in a very exclusive uh, heritage collection of um, heirloom dianthus or 2,000 mag uh, 2, um, dahlias grown down in Cornwall of the National Dahlia Collection. So uh, they can be as broad um, or as compact um, as, as you like. Um, it's a diverse group of people who hold them. There are a diverse bunch of collections. So a little bit of the history, um, plant heritage uh, or the National Plant Collections have been going for over 40 years now. Um, there were concerns in the 1970s, it was a very pre prescient uh, decade for plant conservation, um, about the fact that we were losing just quite a lot of our familiar garden plants. Um, and in response to this, uh, the RHS convened a large conference full of lots of very notable names from horticulture, from private estates, botanic gardens, uh, the nursery trade. Um, to say, well, what can we what can we do about this? How can we prevent our cell, our horticultural uh, world losing plants? Um, and out of this came the idea to set up national plant collections with the idea that different people would collect an entire group of plants and keep them in trust for the future. So the first collections were set up just a few years later, um, and originally Plant Heritage was called the National Council for Conservation of Plants and Gardens, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, but, uh, but yes, so the first national plant collections were set up about 40 years ago, uh, and I think there's 30, more or less 30, that are still with us. Uh, so here are some of the original ones um, from, from that original 40 years ago. Um, at the time, I think they went around places that they already knew had good collections of certain plant groups um, and encourage them to build on those um, and get collections set up properly. 
But 40 years later, we've had a name change. We're now called Plant Heritage, which rolls off the tongue a lot easier. Um, and there are, well, we're getting on to 700 national plant collections all around the country in Britain and in Ireland. And the, sorry, Channel Islands, you've been cut off that map at the Channel Islands as well. Um, so we, it's a continual process of um, adding new collections. We had 35 new collections accredited uh, last year. Um, of course, it's a continual process that we lose collections too. Um, so we lost about 20 last year. Um, retirement generally, uh, disease sometimes. Um, if all goes well, the plan is that they ought to be handed on. We try and encourage collection holders now to think of a succession plan. So what should you do if you're no longer able to look after your collection? You know, would you who could you nominate to, to look after it? Um, but yeah, sometimes collections, like we've just lost one of the Ilex collections because Phytophthora has gone all the way through it. Um, so yeah, we are still at the mercies somewhat of um, pest and disease and old age and retirement um, and all sorts. Um, but the collections that we do have, uh, we reckon there's about 95,000 plants um, held within them. So that's larger than, you know, most botanic gardens, any other collection, you know, so considered as a whole, this is a, you know, a huge resource um, for horticulture and it does represent a massive um, diversity of all the cultivated plants that we have in the UK. Ooh, right now, who holds them? So this is something that I, I found quite interesting when um, when I first did these statistics. That actually, nearly forty percent are held by private individuals in their own um, back gardens or held as part of um, their sort of other uh, interests. Um, and another twenty percent, almost, are held by nurseries, usually small independent uh, specialist plant nurseries. So it's very much uh, the small small enthusiasts that are keeping this going. So um, here we've got uh, Linda um, Linda Hayward. She's got the Echium National Plant Collection. That is an absolute stunner to go to visit if you can see it in May. Um, she's actually got it at Renishaw Hall up in Derbyshire. But uh, when I went to see it, there was uh, it was just full of these huge four meter towering spikes. And people think you can't grow them up in you know up in the Pennines and in Derbyshire, but these were flourishing. Um, so definitely a fantastic collection, uh, really passionate about her plant group. Um, we've got Jackie Curry here. She's got the Alley of National Plant Collection. She holds it on her allotment. Um, so it must be a very a visual feast for the other allotment holders. Um, Barry here, he's, a, he's the botanist at Hilliers, which has 14 collections at Hilliers. But he personally, because he's so passionate, has another five national plant collections that he holds in a piece of woodland that he's got not far from his house. Um, so that's him displaying his Rubus collection at Hampton Court. So, yeah, they're held in a huge um, range of institutions um, and gardens, but they're also uh, we've also got another category of collections called dispersed collections. So they only came in a few years back, but that allows interested groups or societies uh, to hold a collection across many different places. So um, this is quite useful for maybe particularly large plants. So um, the Northeast Group of Plant Heritage has just set up a collection of um, Physocarpus shrubs held across about 10 different members um, all across the um, Northeast. So this allows certain plant groups that are a little bit awkward to, um, to grow maybe in one place um, to, be, to be grown across multiple places. Uh, and then on to why? Well, yeah, why, why should we bother conserving our cultivated plant? It's a really interesting question because, you know, when we think of cons uh, conservation and plant conservation, the first thing that everyone thinks of is all wild species and natural areas, because that is, of course, you know, a real a pressing priority and a concern for everyone. Uh, but I think that in the UK, we ought to recognise that we've got this really long history of, um, of going out and gathering plants from around the world, bringing them back here, putting them in these grand estates. We've got a huge long history of plant breeders, both amateur and professional, who contributed so much to our history of um, our history of plants and our, you know, and the, and the beauty and diversity of our gardens. So I really think we should think of that as a, a heritage value and a reason for, for not wasting this resource that we've built up over all of these years. Um, so I think there is real value in, in conserving uh, cultivated plants. 
Uh, I'll probably mention a few times that, you know, there is sort of threats and dangers facing cultivated plants. Um, some of them are listed here. So a big one is a loss of specialist nurseries. Uh, there was an RHS report, I think, that came out recently saying something like 50% of independent specialist nurseries had closed since 20, the year 2000, I think, in the last 20 years. You know, it's, it is a real, often people do it out of passion. It's not a huge money spinner uh, or the real specialists tend to go because people are buying things from B&Q and chains and the rest of it. And they're not providing the real diversity that, you know, they're just sort of buying things in from Holland in bulk and putting them on maybe. Um, it's these small specialist nurseries where the real diversity of plants and the real expertise is. So that's one threat. Um, another is changes in fashion. So gardening is just as fashionable as any other area. Um, an interesting aside, I, we redid our website a couple of years ago and on the changes in fashion uh, blurb, it had a little bit about how no one would, would be seen dead with houseplants in macrame hangers anymore, which I think says a bit about how outdated our website was, <laughs> but also how things have come around again. So, um, so yeah, there's, there's changes in what's popular, you know, and if we lose all of the effort in breeding what's suddenly out of fashion anymore, it won't be there for when it inevitably does come back into fashion. So um, I think there's a lot to be said for keeping things going, even if they're not trendy at the moment. Another thing is um, loss of specialist skills. Um, some plants might have particular cultivation needs, propagation needs. I mean, how many times, you know, how often do you see those sort of 1950s sprays of indoor carnations, that kind of thing done anymore? So, you know, there's a, we, Think, again, it's slightly a fashion thing, but also, you know, if we lose some of these things, we lose the plants that go with them. Um, again, we can um, lose some of these cultivars. Of course, a lot of plants are threatened in the wild and are existing in our gardens. Um, there's, again, I've mentioned before this long history of bringing plants into the country. Um, that has possibly denuded some of them from the wild. However, it's even more imperative that we should be keeping them here, propagating them here, and certainly not taking any more from the wild. And that even in some instances, uh, plants from collections have gone to repopulate um, populations that are lost in the wild. Um, so collections can consist of species or cultivars. It's not one or the other. Um, and many collections do uh, contain plants that are, that are threatened in the wild. And then the last one is, is loss of gardens. You know, if we don't have such big, partly private gardens, you know, everyone's gardens are getting smaller and um, that leads to less diversity of plants in a lot of cases. Um, public gardens too, you know, a lot of the, um, you know, I remember working for the council back in the 90s and they had acres and acres of glass houses which were just going to rack and ruin because they, you know, they didn't have the staff anymore and they weren't they weren't doing that kind of propagation of specialist plants. It was, you know, it was a bit of a dying art. And so, you know, again, we're, we're losing that kind of thing as well. So there are definite threats to plants in cultivation. Um, so hopefully that's um, inspired you to think that, yes, it, having a collection, it's a really good thing to do and I should do it myself. So what are the criteria for holding a national plant collection? Well, uh, one thing is it needs to be documented. Now, so much of gardening knowledge goes around inside the gardener's head. Um, but for a national plant collection, it is expected that that is somehow written down so that we've got a record of it. Um, now, back in the day when these uh, first collections were set up, we've got lots of beautiful copper plate handwriting plant lists of uh, everything that's in a collection. But um, we have moved on somewhat nowadays um, and we do have our own sort of custom database to allow plants to be recorded to a common standard and get the, all the images and cultural information and just all that knowledge of a collection holder um, together and ordered and secure because um, the knowledge is just as important as the plants. You know, I think that's something that's really been key to me over these last few years is realising just how important all the extra information is. Um, it's more than just about having a plant, it's about having the knowledge of that plant. 
So the second thing is, of course, uh, it has to be well labeled because you need to link that plant that you've got in the ground with that record that you've got um, on your computer. So, um, so yeah, it's always a hot topic uh, among collection holders is how you're coping with labeling. Uh, what different methods do you use? Another criteria is that it has to be open to the public to view. Um, but that can come in many forms. Uh, some collections, of course, are in public gardens, so that's fine, nice and easy. They're there all the time. Um, or even in, yeah, even in sort of paid for gardens, that's fine. Um, but all these private collection holders, they may decide to hold an open day, say once a year when they know their collection is looking particularly good um, and invite people in and come and view their collection. Uh, or they may um, have a, a by appointment system, so um, people can just ring up if they've got a particular interest. Um, but it is important, I think, to be open to view because part of it is a resource. It's our, it's a national resource, um, and it should be seen as a, a national resource for gardeners and plant breeders and garden historians and you know anyone with an interest and a passion in that plant group. Um, it has to be comprehensive within its chosen scope. I shall go into a bit more detail in that later on, but it should have a good representat representative sample of what you say it's got. Um, so people know what to expect when they're going to visit. Um, and then finally, um, well, it's good to have some airs and spares. We do require, make it a requirement that you don't just have one of anything, because that is quite, that's not great from a conservation point of view. So, um, so yeah. An, an air and a spare is required to make sure that there's a robust um, system should you lose one. Uh, we do make exception for tree collections. Um, we usually ask them for uh, evidence that they can propagate them if they need to. Yeah, so I mentioned uh, scope earlier on there. Um, it's off, I still hear it quite often um, today, and it was our previous criteria was you had to have 75% of available taxa in your chosen genus, um, which actually was quite restrictive because um, things like hosta, I think there's something like 5,000 of them knocking around, dahlias, probably not far off that as well. You know, it actually becomes really uh, difficult if you think, oh my gosh, I've got to collect all of them. 10,000 of these plants. So, um, so in 2013, um, the categories were revised to allow for smaller and more manageable uh, collection scopes. And so we've got reference horticultural and historic collections. Um, and that allows us to have things like um, regional fruit collections. So we've got about 13 now regional fruit collections all around the country, um, including this, um, these apples from the East Midlands that's held at the National Trust Clumber Park. Um, and actually, I was speaking to the um, one of the chaps at Brogdale who is really supportive of this, which is the National Fruit Collection, the big one. Um, they realise they can't hold all the apples in their collection that exist in the UK. Um, so having these regional collections actually mops up some of the um, some of the more sort of local varieties that they wouldn't keep themselves. Um, some of the uh, horticultural categories can include things like, um, you know, hostas bred by a certain person. So you could narrow it down to just hostas bred by, um, yeah, a certain hosta breeder. Can't think of any off the top of my head. <laughs> um, and we've also got uh, yeah historic collections. Um, so that, for example, um, this is from the picture from the National Trust's uh, collection of Harold Comber plants. Now, Harold Comber was a plant collector from the early 20th century who lived at Nyman's or who grew up at Nyman's anyway. Um, I think his father might have been the head gardener there. So he grew up there and always had a close association and sent most of his plants back there. Um, but in recognition of the work that he did, they've got the collection of plants that he brought back from um, Australia and Tasmania at Nyman's Gardens. So this allows us to be a lot more flexible with uh, what can be a national collection. If you really want a collection and you've only got space for 20 plants, there will be 20 plants that, you know, you've got a real passion for um, and can make a collection of. Um, or still, if you've got 10,000 and really want to collect all 10,000, we encourage that as well. So let's go into a few more details about some of these collections. So the reference collections, they tend to be the bigger ones because they are still aiming for that nearly all you can get in a certain genus. So those are sort of almost the, the hangovers from the, the previous scopes. Um, but they can be 
fantastically diverse within that. Uh, so uh, we've got a beautiful passion flower at the top there. That's from the collection of John van der Plank. He has done a huge amount of work researching um, passion flowers in the wild. He set up his national plant collection, I think in the mid eighties when his tutor at Horticultural College said, oh, there's only about 30, why don't you go for it? Anyway, now he's got a couple of hundred and he's been out to Venezuela and South America um, trying to do uh, wild conservation of passifloras. Um, he's been bringing them back to the UK, researching which ones grow here, how to make them flower. Apparently, they're quite variable as to how they flower. They don't even know in the wild what triggers them to flower. You know, it might just be, you know, an El Nino year and maybe they'll flower. So uh, it does seem to be there's a, a lot, a lot of interesting research to be done on the on the passion flowers. Um, there's also, we've got the picture from the Betula collection, the birches at Stone Lane Gardens. That's, uh, again, hundreds of different taxa that he's got there, and he's still actively going out researching new ones. Um, and he got a grant from us last year um, to go to an exhibition expedition to Greenland. And you wouldn't have thought it, but Greenland has one forest. Um, it is a very small one. <laughs> It's quite dwarf, apparently, but it has, it's really rare, obviously endemic, very dwarf um, betula. So he's off out there um, whenever the pandemic allows to go and, um, and go and hunt rare betula in this um, the micro forests of Greenland. Um, and closer to home, uh, we've got the Dryopteris uh, collection held by Anthony Piggott. Now, Dryopteris are native to the UK and he has done a huge amount of research um, trying to untangle. It's quite a complicated genus. They all hybridize with each other. Um, and his work has shown that some of what's in his collection actually is incredibly rare um, in the wild. And he's been helping sort of conserve the wild populations by improving our knowledge of of plants, um, of the plants in his collection. Those are the reference collections. Uh, we have a horticultural collections. They're still by far the biggest category, such as the um, such as the, the Malus collections. They can also be collections by um, sort of characteristic as well. So these are uh, a dwarf dwarf hosta collections. Um, so that's by plant type. Um, uh, yeah. So your standard. Uh, cultivar collections tend to fall into the horticultural category because they're trying to collect, say, all the cultivars um, of a certain species. And then there are the historic collections, which is, I think, possibly our fastest growing category at the moment. Um, and these can, these can come in quite a few diverse different ways. We've got a uh, well, we were talking earlier about the um, Cedric Morris irises that Lou has been collecting. Uh, that has been that collection was first put together by Sarah Cook um, in Suffolk. She's, uh, I think, I think she even went to Benton End as a child. I think she, I remember her saying. Um, so she's got this childhood memory of going to Benton End and seeing the irises, and then as an adult was sparked to just think about, well, could I rebuild this collection? Can I find all of these irises again? So she has done a phenomenal amount of research, historical research, trying to track down all the Benton irises and bring them together into one collection um, to make sure that they genuinely are Benton irises and not ones that have been uh, sort of mislabeled over the course of time. Um, but yeah, uh, she's been, all, I think, all over Europe to various gardens trying to, um, trying to hunt down these distinctive irises. Uh, some are based on a plant collector. Um, so the Nyman's collection I mentioned earlier was an actual plant collector, actual plant collector. But this collection here at Hampton Court, where I used to work, uh, was based on um, Queen Mary's collection. She was a very early plant collector in the 1680s, I believe. But she did what royals did and sent other people around the world to do the collecting for her. But she brought together huge list of plants, very, a lot, she loved the exotics. They had one of the first glass houses um, to try and, you know, keep them going. And they were, um, William of Orange was Dutch. So of course he brought all this horticultural technology over. Is that a question from Lou? I'm just going to be the annoying person. Yes. Exotics. Yes. So that was the original spelling. The, the, that's how Queen Mary spelt exotic. Oh, right. Okay. Thank you very much. 
I didn't know. <laughs> you kept the original spelling. <laughs> oh, shut up. That's all right. It gives it a bit of that sort of seven, you know, 1890s or 1780s flair or whatever. <laughs> um, but they had the original plant list. So the original collection existed until the 1920s when the First World War obviously did for all the gardeners uh, and the actual original collection disappeared. But over the last 20 years, they've, they had the original plant list from her records and they've been building it back up um, to try and recreate it and display it how it would have been displayed. Um, so yeah, historical interest there. Um, uh, and there are other collections that are very much based on the place, so for, such as um, like the rhododendron hybrids that were raised at Bodnum between a certain period of time. So that really just recognises that this place contributed uh, something significant to horticulture and they're trying to conserve the plants um, in the place. So if you're still not convinced after all of that why you should have a national plant collection, so um, I think one of the biggest reasons that you might want to have for a national plant collection is that you just get to contribute something back to the world of horticulture. You know, you're contributing knowledge, you're contributing to the conservation of plants. Um, if you've got an interest in heritage and conservation, you know, it enables you to sort of really focus research on a certain area um, and help with our help with our understanding of people and places. Um, so we've got a collection of Narcissus at the bottom here. He was a breeder, quite a not very well known breeder, just a local chap in uh, Sussex, I believe he was. Um, and our Sussex group have taken this on as a dispersed collection. Each of them hold a certain number of his cultivars. Um, and it's quite nice because he named it after local landmarks and like local places. So it, again, it, it ties in that feeling of plants with people and, and places. Another new uh, collection that we accredited recently is at the Churchill College, Cambridge, of course, Churchill College named for Winston Churchill. Um, and he actually was a very keen plantsman, or he certainly took a very keen interest in anyone wanting to name a plant after him. Um, and their archive has records of original correspondence um, with Churchill and the breeder, you know, making sure that it was met his exacting standards. Um, and I have to say, given that we've they've just plonked them in a vase, they all go quite well together. So I don't know whether he had a bit of an aesthetic um, bent on, on the plants that he uh, decided to have named after him. Um, and John Moore has gone all around looking for plants named after Winston Churchill. I think he had to track the Winston Churchill rose down to Australia. So although it was bred in the UK in the 1950s, um, it had been lost from from all UK collections and UK nurseries. Um, eventually he managed to track it down to a rose collection in Australia uh, and got cutting material back before uh, Brexit and all kinds of difficulties, um, managed to get it propagated. And of course now the rose collection in Australia has closed. So actually that was a real lucky thing that he managed to get that rose when he did and get it back and get it into his collection where it will now be secure forevermore. So, uh, really pleasing to see. Um, another collection that very much collected, uh, connected to person and place is the Sir Frederick Stern collection. That's down in Sussex as well, in Worthing. Um, Frederick Stern was, uh, he was a real chalk plants expert. He wrote this sort of seminal book in the 50s on growing plants in chalk. And he was well connected and he sent, he had plant collectors all around the world collecting plants that were very much adapted to super thin uh, chalk soils. So, um, so that collection was now was gifted to Worthing uh, Borough Council and recently about two years ago they managed to get a grant of almost a million pounds off the back of that collection to try and conserve it preserve it tell its story get all the interpretation and archive materials in order um, so I think that's a really good idea a really good example of um, well people valuing the, uh, the fact that plants can be um, heritage too. Uh, other great reasons to have a natural plant collection. Um, it's all about research and demonstration. It's all about just showing, showing people, showing the gardening public what is available, what's out there. Um, and, and being at the cutting edge of research. So this is a very new natural plant collection that's just been accredited, the Aracaceae. Uh, it's at Ventnor Botanic Garden in Isle of Wight. Uh, and it has a very unique microclimate in that it can grow a lot of the palms outside. So, um, so it has a collection of hardy palms, which is the Aracaceae. 
Um, and they've been doing some experiments over the last 20 years or so um, with what will and what won't grow. Um, so they've, I think the oldest two, their trachycarpus there are two of the original trachycarpus that Fortune brought back from his travels. Um, seed was sent all around the country. Uh, didn't germinate or the plants didn't do very well in all the glass houses at Kew, etc. But the ones that they planted outside here on the south coast of the Isle of Wight thrived. Um, but they were the only two for many, you know, hundreds of years almost, uh, it's about 200 years ago those were planted. Um, they couldn't get any of the other um, any of the other Aracaceae to grow outside. But in the last 20 years, they reckon they've had a 20 fold increase in the palms that can grow outside in our climate, uh, which uh, is kind of a sign of a changing climate, I think. Um, but yeah, they're certainly at the sort of the front end of that research about what we can now, what we will in the future be able to grow uh, perhaps uh, in our gardens. They're also at the cutting edge of looking for the pests that come in because there's some um, particularly nasty weevils, I believe, that they are on the lookout for. But um, yeah, another pest. Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's uh, the other real value of collections. It's ensuring um, we've got all the provenance and the identification of plants right. So that can be a real minefield. You know, things sort of bounce around in the nursery trade under multiple different names. And having one place where you can assess all of the plants in a certain plant group and uh, say, so, yeah, that's actually that. And that's really just been renamed, but it's that uh, is incredibly, incredibly valuable. Um, a particular example of this is the uh, we've got another very new national plant collection um, of Hoya. Um, she's been doing lots of work uh, trying to sort out the provenance of these plants that come in. She says there's a huge amount of things that are mislabeled or they're sold as something really rare, but actually they're not they're quite common. And another thing is uh, cowboy traders selling things from the wild when they really shouldn't be. So, um, so sort of for, for someone who's not that clued up, it can be a bit of a minefield. So she is passionate about getting these plants properly identified from proper proper sources not from dodgy um not from dodgy wild source material and then making them making them available in the UK so that you can know that they've got properly identified properly sourced plants um the other reason is just to be the expert so there's so little research that goes on on so much of our garden flora you know there is no team of scientists working on all these obscure plant groups it's you, you know, it comes down to you, you know, as a collection holder to, to, to be the expert and to make that contribution to, um, to our plant knowledge. Um, so the final example I've got here is, uh, this is a beautiful flower of the Scadoxus. You probably are more familiar with the, the orangey red ball shaped ones. Um, but the collection holder here is a private collection holder in Devon. Um, and he'd been in touch with some Norwegian researchers, sort of doctorate university researchers um, who, oh, so yeah, Norwegian. And uh, they came over to see his collection and they were over the moon because they'd only ever seen them from herbarium, you know, squashed herbarium specimens. And they'd never had the actual plants in front of them to work from. And they were able to, you know, sort of prove some of their theories or hypotheses about what may or may not, you know, be sort of, I don't know, beyond me a little bit this, but uh, they... Uh, you know, they, they found it so fascinating that they could see these plants all together and not have to go to Zimbabwe or Tanzania uh, to go see them. Um, but he was later invited on a trip to go to um, Zimbabwe and find, and so he's been out with them now, um, hunting plants, um, collecting seed legally of, of species, and they've found that I think there are more species than they thought there were because of partly because of the, um, the work that he's been able to contribute. Um, and he was meant to be going over there when he did go over there to present a paper all about the research and how the work of plant heritage has helped this big international conference. Uh, but it was in early March 2020. And of course, he flew out there and then the whole world stopped for COVID. So sort of sat around in the airport for a few days and flew back. But anyway. <laughs> But it just goes to show what an adventure you can go on once you start voyaging into the world of collections and plants. <laughs> So of course we don't just do natural plant collections here at Plant Heritage. I'll just quickly go through some of the other things we have on the go. Um, we have a threatened plants program. So how do you know what's rare in the wild? We've got all kinds of data going back hundreds of years about what's, what grows in our countryside and I know, is it going up, is it going down? 
there isn't anything like that for our garden plants. So uh, one of our projects is to try and work out, compile all of this data from nurseries, from botanic gardens, from other public gardens, from national collections to work out, well, what is actually rare? What should be a priority for conservation? Um, you know, what what's what's maybe common and you don't need to worry about. It's actually information that's surprisingly hard to find or a pain to compile. So uh, this is quite a unique resource enabling us to give information back to collection holders, say, collection holders to say, yep, these things are particularly rare. Um, and uh, off the back of that work, we ran a Threaten Plant of the Year competition at Hampton Court uh, this year, just gone. Um, it was won by uh, a camellia, which was in the guardian, uh, in the garden of one of our members, a plant guardian member. Um, and he'd had it in his garden for 35 years, um, but he'd lost the label. He couldn't remember what it was. Um, but he thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll just go and check and see if it could be something quite unusual. Um, and luckily, he had kept in his shed in a chocolate box tin every single plant label of everything he'd bought since 1981. So he was able to go through that tin, found the original plant label, which gave the name of the plant and where it had come from and how much he paid for it, etc. Um, and it turned out that it's something that had dropped out of the nursery trade. So, um, so it was eligible for this competition and it was felt that it was a really unusual plant with a great history. It had been bred in the 1960s at um, Tregrayan House down in Cornwall. So um, a house with a long history of um, noted plants, people attached to it. Um, really lovely story and a great sort of way that it was found and I think a lesson to us all about how we should all be keeping the plant label somewhere safe <laughs> when we get things. Um, the uh, the, the uh, public vote was won by oh Philip Ostenbrick, surprise surprise for his Aspidistra, uh, beautiful plant, stunning variegation, um, was originally from a glass house at Glass Nevin um, in Ireland, I think a cutting of that went to Alison Rutherford and he's got a cutting of that so I think we only know two locations for it so definitely quite rare um if you think you have a rare plant please enter it 2022 details will follow somewhere anyway next year on our website uh, we also run a plant guardian scheme so this is in recognition that not everyone has space for a natural plant collection okay uh, we do understand that if you've only got a windowsill um, you can still have a, a you know a sort of a rare plant or unusual plant um, and by having these locations recorded for rare plants it can be used to either you know take them back into national plant collections if they've been lost from collections. Sometimes new collection holders can find plants that are in the plant guardian scheme that aren't available anywhere else. Uh, we've got about 1600 plants in it now, so that's bigger than most national plant collections. Um, and it just gives us that all important record of what plant is where. Um, it was so important for us, rare and unusual plants. We also do a plant exchange each year. So that's the way that members can get involved. Um, we put rare plants through it. So it's two or fewer entries in the RHS plant finder. So it's quite easy to spot where you've got a rare plant and um, members can get involved. We all bring plants to a central location once a year. Um, they're all sorts from trees to house plants, to shrubs, to um, tiny little things that you suddenly think, what on earth is that? Um, when you get the list of plants that are being offered every year, it's just a bit like, oh, I don't even know where to start. It's just sort of a plant lover's dream. Um, and yeah, it's I think it's just a great way to sort of get, get involved in, and free plants, everyone. Come on, this is this is what we're about, surely. Free rare plants. Uh, so yeah, um, so fantastic way of uh, swapping and sharing and getting these rare plants in greater circulation. Uh, we are a membership charity, so uh, we've got about three and a half thousand members across various local groups all around the country. Um, and these local groups, they raise funds to help us. Um, they also help support and maintain some of the collections in their area. So they might go and you know do an afternoon of weeding or propagating for a collection. Um, and it's uh, they organise talks and workshops and garden visits and um, propagation days and plant fairs, all the rest of it. So um, it's just a good way of getting involved with other fellow like minded plant people that you might find around the country um, and helping to support, support plant heritage at the same time. 
And yeah, that's it. That's us. That's what we do. Um, we're great. Please come and support us. <laughs> we do loads of talks, um, virtual talks, or well, we certainly did do over the winter, not so many now in the summer, but I'm sure it'll gear up again over the over the winter months. Um, we've got a journal and directory and we have loads of local group activities. And um, yeah, you're just helping support the work that we do um, in plant conservation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vicky. That was amazing. Um, I can vouch for your talks because, to be honest with you, after I'd paid for, I think it was maybe four or five talks, I thought to myself, why am I doing this? If I just joined Plant Heritage, I could be getting these talks for free. Um, and for the price that you actually charge for joining Plant Heritage, it's, it's nothing. It's certainly... Um, it puts the RHS to shame. Um, I, I'll be honest, I've got, I don't really get much out of the RHS. I pay my yearly subscription. It's an absolute fortune. I get free entry and yeah, I mean, I've probably used that maybe twice in the last year. I used it to go to Harlow Car. Not been the best year for visiting. Garden. No, no, yes. not really. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I got, I got into Harlow Car and I've been into Hyde Hall, um, and that's been my limit, really. Well, they've only got five gardens. We've got 689 national plant collections. I mean. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so um, you kind of asked my question. You answered my question. Um, my question, and don't forget, if anybody else wants to answer, ask questions, please do put them in the bottom um, in the chat. Um, but my question was... With your ilex, the Phytophthora, um, if you'd had a dispersed plant collection, um, obviously it's tricky with something as big as ilex. Would that perhaps have given a chance of saving I it? I think that's a really good point. You know, we are, in a sense, some collections can be monocultures. So by spreading it out as a dispersed collection, you are definitely mitigating the risk of that. So, yeah, another plus point for all that so what we did with the ilex is we did go through the list there is another ilex collection which is at which is at rhs rosemore uh, and we did make sure we cross-referenced those lists to make sure that there was what was missing there was only about half a dozen things they didn't have and we'll work with uh, we might try and see if we can micro propagate some of those to okay so i mean the collection. not but everything it, has been lost then not everything has been lost no i think i think the, most of it is duplicated in the other ilex collection which again shows the value of duplicating collections we definitely welcome more than one collection of the same group if there's a if your favorite plant group has a collection already don't worry you know i think the more the merrier it, it ensures against this kind of loss different part of the country different climate conditions Pests, you know, I think it's all valid. Is there a, is there like a minimum number of plants in the collection that you can have to make it? Yes. Ginkgo. You'd think ginkgo would be the easiest one to collect because there's only one. But <laughs> this is really funny. Yeah. So that's what the guy who's got the ginkgo collection thought. Do you know how many he's now got? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hundred. <laughs> So yeah, that's the danger. You think it's going to be a small genus, but you know, once the bug bites you and you start you know, snuffling out all these weird and wonderful things that have been bred all across, I think it's got a lot from Japan. Um, then yeah, you, you do end up with maybe more than you thought for. But yeah, there is a minimum number. I think it's sort of seven taxa for, for your first collection. And then sometimes subsequent collections sometimes can be smaller. Um, but yeah, that's that's the minimum because partly it's got to have some interest for people to visit. And yeah, that's true. That is true. I mean, if there was a plant, uh, I think there probably are some fairly you know small plant groups out there. Um, but even then, you know, even if it's a very small plant group, you know, there might be only a couple of species and a couple of cultivars. You could still collect, say, species from different parts of its range, you know, from sort of north part to the south part or from different locations. And that might give you more sort of genetic diversity within the collection. So it's not all about just number of species. It could be, you know, you've got a species from north of Russia and a species, the same species, but from Kazakhstan or from England, you could say. There you go. You know, maybe the genetic diversity. about it in that sense then. But, <laughs> Cheryl, can I get you to unmute? Because you asked a question, um, which I thought was a, a, an 
teasing uh, uh, question. Are you <laughs> Cheryl? You on mute? Hi, hello. Hi. Um, yeah. So my question was. Um, have you had any scenarios where the name of a plant genus has changed? Um, and so then somebody's poor collection just becomes redundant or part of somebody else's. I was just thinking, you know, it was it two years ago, Rosemarinus became part of Salvia. Yes. So what if you had the Rosemarinus collection? You know, it'd be gutting. Yeah, well, that actually luckily has become Salvia Rosmarinus. So all we needed to do was change the name. And we did give them a grant to buy a load of get their labels done because that's suddenly <laughs> 200 engraved labels to do at once. Um, but there are other examples. I think the, oh God, the poor old Hebe people have now got to live with Veronica. Um, so yeah, Hebe's have become Veronica's. We're in the process, we're mid change with that. So the new collections are now called Veronica, but we need to gently let down some of the older collections that they might have to change all their signage to be Hebe. But usually the RHS has a little system, you know, it'll it'll call it Veronica brackets H or something like that to make to make the distinction between the ones that used to be Hebe and the ones. That what if you've got something like Dicentra where part of it stayed Dicentra and part of it went to Lampra Campanus? Or... Yeah, if you have a look at the collection names you'll see some quite manglings of the English language where we have to say you know it's this but excluding this excluding this but including this so we <laughs> just, uh, we you know there's we've got a taxonomist on our panel who decides collections and so we just go uh Dawn how do we uh <laughs> capture this and she'll <laughs> she'll give us a very neat succinct taxonomist's answer of how we should how we should re-title the collection. Does that answer your question there, Cheryl? <laughs> um, and I think, was it Joshua? I think you had a question. Would you like to unmute? Hi. Um, hey, Joshua. Does any, Hi. Do any schools uh, have national collections or involved in the plant guardian scheme? Because we do an awful lot around conservation in terms of animals and uh, insects oh. and so on. Uh, but we're doing more gardening with me being involved, so I just wondered. Yeah, there are a few schools who are involved. Um, there's one down in Hampshire somewhere, which uh, which has quite a few plant guardian plants, and I think they're slowly working their way up to having a collection, uh, duplicating one of the other collections that's nearby that might be near retirement. Um, so. So there's that, and I think we've had inquiries from some school gardeners. So some usually private schools have got some beautiful estates and stuff. We've got some collections on on those estates but, but yeah i think it's something that would be really great to do because it's it's a really great way of actually getting quite hands-on with, you know, with conservation and plants and if you know you're actually doing something quite practical so, i don't know that. if this bears any relevance but um you've got the is it the ritherlington orchid project oh my god they're amazing aren't they aren't they yes and yes i mean that is the most amazing academy school i don't know it, it it's a bit like a science lab but gone on steroids and it's a school it's amazing I had the most amazing co uh, conversations at the shows with 11 year olds who know everything about orchid conservation they're working with other schools in uganda about sort of swapping plant material and, and learning and teaching how to propagate properly and um i don't know it's just fantastic to see the kids so engaged and so knowledgeable um so, yeah, yeah, more like that. I think it's more down to one passionate teacher. But, yeah. it, I mean, the the I went there. Um, I think it was in 2018 for the Orchid Show, and you just go. It the the whole of the school is just like if Carlsberg made schools. You know, it it's just everything is pumped up to a proper sort of. It sounds daft, adult degree, you know, you mm. no dumbing down at all, which and and the kids they 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 rise up to it. Mm. You know, don't they don't feel daunted, they've been empowered by it. And like you say, you know, you're having a conversation with an 11 year old and they know more than you ever will. Yes, yeah, it really was like really inspiring. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if they have anything to do with plant heritage but 
uh, uh, I think my friend was making my colleague was making some inquiries <laughs> excellent excellent um to so that, sorry to interrupt your question Joshua I just had that's, to... that's fine that's interesting um we, we just ended up with we, we, I, I work in a, a school which also has a forest school attached mm. um, and essentially I've been given a large amount of responsibility for the gardening and it's it, it's I've actually been given time this year to do it. That they, they've actually budgeted in the fact that I will have time outside of lessons to be able. I'm a teacher. Um, okay, yeah. But, that's but they've good. actually budgeted in the fact that I will do part of the gardening with the long term aim that I will be able to do some of the kids eventually once we've got things established. But we're, we're looking that we have quite a lot of different conditions that we've got um, the forest school, but then we've also got dry areas and wet areas. Um, but it's also much bigger than my garden, so I'm allowed to plant things which I wouldn't ever plant in my garden because they'd run rampant. <laughs> <laughs> With a mass forest area, I can plant things which can just grow and spread. Mm. And yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, maybe you want a collection that can be fairly low maintenance, you know, that isn't going to be... Because you know, that's usually the school problem with schools is summer holidays, isn't it? What's, does yes, yeah. So the look after I'm it. woodland board, but I've had to plant for things which be in flower either early in the year or late in the year because there's no point in being in flower for the summer holiday when no one's there. Mm. Yes, absolutely. But yeah, so actually every year we publish a missing genera list, which is um, plant groups that we don't have a collection for. So even though we've got 600 old collections, it's probably another 600 plant groups that we don't have collections for. So if anyone is interested in sort of having a browse and maybe taking on something completely new, um, all the details are on our website. So we'll have a look. Um, I think Ginny made a good point, um, and I don't know if this is a thing that you guys would do. Um, I don't know if Jenny remembers what good points she made, but um, it's to do with the actual recording of labels and stuff like that. Um, and I had a thought that get, setting up a database um, and then sending it out to the people who are, have your national collection um, so that literally all they have to do is just fill in the gaps. Do you do something along those lines or do people? Yeah, so what we've done, uh, what we've developed over the last eight years really is a web-based database so that um, any collection holder can use it anywhere they've got the internet. And it is a sort of a, it's been designed by collection holders to be used for collections so they can just, yeah, as you say, fill in the blanks, they can customise it and add whatever is suitable for their collection, whatever information they want to store. You know, we've got some people who are doing phenomenal amounts of research, others just have a very sort of, they're just about the plants, but the idea was to make it very flexible and customisable so it would be useful for as many people as possible. Um, and that's, I think, a really good way of making sure that the, the information and the knowledge is, is as safe as plants because um, we have had instances where you know someone has passed on and they no one knew their passwords and then that entire life's work can just be gone in an instance so um you know if you don't have a if you don't leave in your will how to look after your information that you know it really is just yeah it's a life's work so uh, i think it should be recognized that, and then, i've never uh, even considered something like that and it's yeah. true yeah i mean if I was to die tomorrow, I mean, thank God, nobody would know my password, but, you know, also nobody would know my passwords. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I think that's something that we, we should value as much as the plants is the information about the plants and the knowledge of collection holders. Well, it's good that you give the, the, the people the, the tools with which to do it. Um, and Jenny, if you'd like to unmute, if you're still around, um, I know that we kept having problems keeping you online, didn't we? Jenny, are you there? I am. Hello, Jenny. Hello. Um, you mentioned, um, I can't remember, um, it was to do with the Passifloras. Yeah, so um, so I just met these people on Twitter. Who, uh, they're at Devon Subtropicals. And I, I took some leave last week and went up to see them. And it's... A lovely couple. I, I don't actually know what they do for their day jobs. We didn't get as far as exploring that. But this is a couple who, just because it's their hobby, have created, they've got a, you know, a bungalow with a garden that's, I don't know, 60 
60 by 60 feet, 60 by 40 feet, maybe something like that. Mm. Um, and have created this absolute paradise. I mean, paradise, collocages and, um, oh you know, gingers and bananas and yes. goddesses with, interspersed cool. with, you know, a really fancy dahlia or a rose that they particularly love or, you know, so it's not one of those purists oh we're only doing one thing kind of thing but the mainly they're doing this um uh hardy subtropical stuff and they've got two glass houses little well greenhouses eight by eight by ten maybe eight by twelve mm -hmm. maybe two of them growing the most I, I i had no idea i had no idea how mm. diverse passiflora could be yes. i certainly had no idea how there are these most amazing varieties that can be grown outdoors or certainly grown outdoors in the south in the uk but then he just casually just <laughs> casually mentioned that there was this particularly glorious one that happened to be in flower that morning i'd got there quite early and apparently they open overnight and close in the day this particular type okay and they're not terribly hardy uh so he just grafted them onto the rootstock of something else help oh clip, together, clip together right. with a clothes peg type okay. arrangements and the grafts were taking and I was just like sorry sorry can I just yes. <laughs> so you're doing this for a hobby and they both went oh yeah you know oh yeah this is just and I was thinking oh my goodness oh my goodness the and if you follow them on Twitter I mean he's been posting quite a lot in the last two weeks or so because they've got open days coming up and honestly if you can get that they're based near Instow which is sort of between um Barnstable and Biddeford mm -hmm. if anybody if you, any of you can get to any of their open days I promise you absolutely be worth it just uh, they've got so much they they've forgotten more about subtropical plants than I've ever known do you know mm, and, yes. and I, I mean that's part of the thing that I love about horticulture in general is it doesn't matter who whether you're professional whether you're amateur blah 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 there is always something new to learn but these yes. people yeah. are yeah. you know if they've got if they've got a national collection there jenny i don't think they've got a national collection no no, no. it doesn't doesn't ring a bell but no uh, no that, but again that's something that i think really is important is that this is something where am amateurs can be have a real contribution to make uh, C completely utterly so so i sort of i suppose i was making the point vaguely that um that you don't have to have a huge garden you don't have to be a head gardener on a large estate mm, to be absolutely. able to do this and you and you don't have to have the whole collection yourself you can it's like you were saying about these dispersed collections mm. you, can, you know share it with other people, with but, people. people but, yeah. but please don't dismiss the the amount of knowledge that is out there that us professional gardeners well for us it can sometimes go a bit under the radar because it's just people who are passionate about their garden and doing their own little thing and unless they get onto something like twitter or <clears throat> facebook or what have you we don't necessarily hear about them i mean in fairness it was non-professional gardeners that got me into gardening it was my grand and my gran and my mum was absolutely bang on and you know she she was a school secretary but she knew the Latin names for 99% of the stuff, but, you know, was out there and, she, you know, she just loved her garden. And it's those people that really, you know, push you into looking at things in a proper way. So, yeah. And um, they, the Passiflora people might be candidates for a national collection. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yes. Follow their passion. <laughs> um, I'm... Just going to check. I, is there anybody else that has any questions? Because I don't, I don't think I've got. So, yeah. Um, if you, you've got a question, quickly unmute yourself and shout. Cheryl, no. Okay, <laughs> a little shaking head. Um, and I think if that's the case, then. Um, so just quickly. Special offer on plant heritage. You've got 12 months for the price of nine if you go direct debit and um, a free gift of Johnson seeds and shower gloves. Um, the shower oh, gloves. What do you want? Wonderful. They make you, your hands smell rubbery. <laughs> no, they're not actually that I the don't. Plant exchange. Them. You get wonderful plants like 
this. Look at my lovely variant. Yeah. So um, I am. I'm kind of been roped in. I'm um, involved in the Hyde Hall. Um, oh yes, yeah. Show. Um, so I, I'm not sort of. You know, I'm not massively involved, but um, I've been asked to give a hand, which I am more than happy to do so. So um, look out at your local um, sort of plant heritage shows, because honestly, the, the plants that you can pick up there, if you're not a member, the plants are an absolute pittance in price, you know, and every single penny does go towards supporting plant heritage. Um, and of course, you know, they're, they're just a really nice bunch of people. They really are. So, yeah. Um, and anything that I, I have, I've forgotten? No? Question from Jenny. Oh, yeah. Um, not a question so much, but I know that my, so my Devon plant heritage, um, they don't just swap plants, but they also swap seeds. Oh yes, yes. There's so. Uh, also, I, should... I can't remember how much I pay a year. I, it, oh, I okay. So it's twenty like a... quid or something. It's it's, it's really, business, really. It's really. absolutely nothing. You know, absolutely nothing. And they send out these lovely newsletters with, you know, news. Obviously, news of what members are doing and so on. But also really really good advice and they've always been so so friendly i mean i have to say i feel slightly ashamed that i've not been more involved than i have been over the last four years but that's because things changed a bit for me but um i just found them well it's like they're they're our tribe <laughs> do, you know, do you know what i mean they but they really are you know because because it's not as it's not the kind of organisation where you feel like you've got to be X many years experienced or professional or, or only amateur or only allotment growing or what have you. It's just like they're just so enthusiastic to talk about any kind of growth, whatever kind of growing it is that you want to do or you're involved in or you're interested in learning about. There's, there will be somebody there's there. Somebody there. there. There's yeah. somebody someone there, there who knows about it and they're to share. about explaining it. And not, I've never, ever felt patronised. Uh, so when I've, you know, I, I remember being, I, I went to do a talk about six years ago, and no, more than that, it's a, many, many years more than that. Anyway, I went to do a talk and a, and an elderly chap came up to me with a, I didn't know that he was actually the chair of that particular association. And he gave me some plants, uh, which were Echium. And I had I had never grown a kim. I I live on Dartmoor. You know, it's it's wet and it's cold and it's you know sometimes it's a little bit sunny, but often it's not. And so I'd never really I'd seen them in exotic places like you know Madeira or Corfu or whatever, but never really seen them around here. And he presented me these plants, saying, "Oh, you'll you'll definitely be able to grow these up where you are." And I had I had no idea. And suddenly it was like, oh my God, Ekia! Ekia! Oh, I mean, I'm completely in love. You know, so. Yeah, so all I suppose I'm rambling on a bit, but um, <laughs> they, you know, they're just it, it. Don't don't think it's anything kind of snooty or exclusive or because no, it really isn't. And you no. don't have to be a collection holder or even have an ambition to be a collection holder to be welcomed into the group. That's very. Uh, that's very good. Very good to say. Yeah, exactly. It is for everyone. It's for everyone with an interest in plants and, and just sort of wants to know more about plants and growing um, and I have to say one of the favorite things that I found about my last sort of two and a half years with plant heritage is talking to a collection holder usually about a plant group that I had no interest in in the past you know just sort of just, meh, they're, they're there they're fine mm. but they you just get so caught up in their passion and their interest mm. and the way you just go I, I love these plants <laughs> I've got to collect them now <laughs> it's just infectious they're you know that, that enthusiasm so yeah that's one of the joys Lovely. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now, but if anyone wants to continue chatting afterwards, as usual, I will leave the um, chat room open. But yes, thank you so much, Vicky. Um, oh, appreciate you coming. So, um, thank you all for coming and thank you all for listening and staying. <laughs> okay, thank you. And I'm stopping the recording now.